costs associated with them going forward as well. Um, item H includes um, the parking lot uh, specifically, and item I is with relation to a general um, renovation that would potentially include the lower level. So that's kind of the general scope, and I think that, that succinctly summarizes the scope, but the scope clearly um, could expand beyond all of that, as not everything that's included in that assessment report would necessarily neatly fall into each of these respective categories. An example of what you're talking about, some of these areas and the costs are a moving target. I happen to write the roofing contractor's licensing exams for the state. The standards for installation are changing rapidly. So each time that we amend or replace a roof, higher insulation requirements have to be met, and there are costs associated with that. It's not always possible to anticipate precisely what those are going to be because the manufacturers haven't caught up to the new standards that are not yet in place. But when we replace those roofs, we will have to have more insulation than we did in the roofs that they're replacing. That's just the trend in that industry. Similarly, there are other changes that are occurring with respect to any of the other mechanical systems or hardscape or so forth that exists in terms of building materials. So these are best estimates based on the information that was available at that time. There is both the time uh, value of money that impacts what this will cost when we do it and changes in specifications that can occur that we don't have documented yet because they're not yet in place. So those are all factors that go into that. These are the best estimates based on, on Ellen Clark working with a direct, our director, working on the technology with CCS and others to try to determine what those costs should be estimated at. But when we actually look at these projects and say we're ready to begin, we will have to do all of the planning and all of the estimating over so that we have the details and reflect what the actual costs are then. It's very difficult. I mean, nobody has a perfect crystal ball. So, you know, you do the best you can with what's available, but there are changes that occur that you simply can't precisely estimate in this, in this process. But this represents the best information that was available at the time from our architects, from, you know, from uh, FQC, uh, and from any other sources that Ellen used. I don't recall that, that uh, Heather did any changing in it. She was already on her way out the door before this came up in the, in the year that she left. Um, and I doubt very much that Gail or, or Betty did any changing in it. So, you know, this is primarily information that Alan provided us. So, um, is the FQC report that you um, uh, were very diligent in providing, and I thank you for it. Um, so I read that report. I think you're right. It is conservative. Um, as I read it, it said we should be spending something like $300,000 a year on maintenance. I'd encourage us or you to advance that so we spend that money. Um, I think all their recommendations on sort of basic maintenance made a lot of sense. And I, uh, I think we should move forward on bidding that out and doing that $300,000 worth of maintenance. It also mentioned the elevators eventually we're going to have to replace. Uh, didn't have a figure for it, but I'm sure we could get one. There was a discussion about the elevators at that meeting. At our finance committee. At the finance yeah. committee groups. And I think uh, Ron felt that information was incorrect in that report. In the, oh, maybe it is. But the elevators at are, some point they will are in be better condition and are newer than what the FQC report suggests. Oh, okay. Well, they good. are not as close to being need, in need of replacement as their report huh. indicated. However, again, 
that's technology that changes over time. I wrote that exam, too, for the city of Chicago. Um, Is there any exam you don't write? <laughs> I write all the building trades exams for the city and about 50 other professions. <laughs> so, um, but the bottom line is what you tend to do, as we did in our last project, is you pool all of those activities so that you're not tearing up walls and making structural changes to too many things one time after another, after another, after another. So in our last project, we completely redid the HVAC system. We completely replaced boilers and, and compressors um, that were out of date. Um, and that was all driven by a mechanical systems audit that, that defined that project's activities. As we get to a point where we think we need to act on several of these at once, we'll pool that again. So as we, are actually the last item may be the one that drives it. Because if we actually do focus on the lower level changes that are out of date, that should, should be under consideration, that will drive the things that need to be done. There's an asbestos, re, you know, re, you know, removal that has to occur uh, because there's still some leftover asbestos in areas that weren't previously addressed. Every time you touch that space, you have to remove whatever asbestos is exposed. But for management reasons, we didn't tear out all the asbestos that's in the building at one time because we weren't changing anything in many of those areas at the time of the project. So it didn't make sense to simply rip stuff up for the sake of ripping it up. Um, so the bottom line is that's all got to be taken care of in, you know, by working with the appropriate engineering firms and architects to identify what issues have to be resolved and addressed mechanically and then, and then decide what changes we're going to make and how they fit into a single project that may address three or four of the items on this list. Well, let me ask a couple questions. Um, and let me just say, to I recognize Anthony has sort of inherited this. You've been very busy managing an outdoor renovation project, and I don't think it's reasonable to expect you to have had, in your first year, a chance to really dig into this capital plan. Um, but um, we heard from our attorney that our, our plan needs to be justified by some sort of a, a cost estimate. Um, and I heard him say a third party cost estimate, some architect, some engineer to say how much these things actually cost. Um, and the study that I read um, doesn't do that today. And I think you're right that the study we have today is conservative. But um, you know, we could go through all these, you know, I, I don't think there's anything that comes up with a $3 million figure for the last one, um, or, or much of any of these, where there's any sort of validation that this particular line item, the cost estimate, is actually close to accurate. And I think we're under an obligation to get that uh, before we adopt this plan. I also recognize we have uh, the board's adopted this plan, I don't know, a year or two ago. So I'm not sure why we would need to vote on this tonight. And I'd prefer to give Anthony a chance to try to come up with some third party estimates that justify the figures in each of these so we can have some confidence that these numbers today uh, make some sense. First of all, it's a long range plan and it's sort of like you're guesstimating what's going to be go happen. And if we look at what happened with the outdoor renovation, when it gets near to happening, I think you have estimates and they may be conservative and it might cost a little bit more. But until you have the specs, that's going to take an awful lot of time in terms of what his priorities are in the next year. Right. I, I agree that, that time-wise, there's better ways to spend our time and our money because it's, it's, it's like Lisa said, until we get close to it, and in my experience in this, 
there are, and like Ron has said, there's all kinds of moving targets. So we have enough of a rough general idea, which is all this document needs to do, so that we get close to it. When something becomes imminent, then we go and spend the money. Otherwise, we're going to spend the money twice. And that's a waste of money, as far as I'm concerned, to, to do an estimate now. It's, it's, it's just a, and a waste of Anthony's time to do work on other things. Because so, the next major project will yeah. be the lower level. And that's going to be major in terms of just going through the planning process, getting the community's involvement, and then, you know. Right. So where do we get $3 million from? Well, I mean, I, I, I can speak to that. Thank I you. would say that any interior renovation project is, is going to very quickly escalate to yeah. the amount that we're, we're looking at here. I mean, this is, a, this is a general target. I can walk that back for a second and say, if you look at item G, last year we were estimating a million dollars for that project. Um, we approved a not to exceed 875 earlier this year when we went forward with um, um, accepting the bid project for that. Um, and that was after substantial discussion and walking out a number of details for other you know, finishes that we could have put in. We could very easily have gotten to a million dollars. So I think item G, uh, just by example in this plan, um, which has been in here for quite some time, um, was very well budgeted. I, th I think that estimate was, was pretty spot on in terms of what we've got here and based upon what we ultimately approved. Um, a $3 million estimate, I mean, that's kind of an all-inclusive um, package. I, there are so many things that you could accomplish with an interior renovation. Depends on what the scope is that you want to look at that. Um, that scope could include bumping up a layer and adding on an additional floor. It could include a comprehensive renovation of the entire lower level. This does not go into great detail about the, what the total totality of that scope could include, but I think an interior renovation very easily could approach $3 million. Okay. Um, Our last yeah. project so, was close to six. <coughs> so what I took away from our attorney's working group is that in order to justify having a special reserve fund, you want to have some third party documenting that these estimates are reasonable rather than just sort of a, you know, blank check. And it's clear... Um, Besides common sense, uh, which, you know, I trust your judgment, Anthony, and, but we, we clearly don't have any sort of third-party documentation for these. And but my we, takeaway was we needed something to justify that these costs are... Well, we are, do have something. It may not be as detailed, but it was done a year ago. And, and he's, but, and but I read the report yeah, said... Yeah, I know. Yeah. That, that said we should spend $300,000 a year on maintenance, which I think we should hurry up and do. But maintenance is different than what we're talking about in the scope of this plan for long range, you know, capital improvement. So maintenance and improvement are two very different things. Maintenance, so, keeping the elevators going, it's keeping the lights on, it's electrical, it's just the day to day wear so and that, tear. That report doesn't justify any of this plan, is no. what you're saying? Yeah. The, because, the issue partly is that the FQC study did not differentiate which fund any of those changes might be paid for, for from. So the operating fund has to cover routine maintenance. It does not, where, you know, the, the, the statutes do not authorize using the special reserve fund for routine operating maintenance. It justifies capital improvements and changes that improve library service. But simply keeping the boilers and the, you know, and the HVAC system and the lighting system running once you've made the improvements is part of operating funds. Uh, they didn't differentiate which was going to cover which cost because that's not the engineering expertise that they brought to the task. But that study that they conducted does provide a reasonable basis for these estimates. Can you show me where? Well, if you look at, in terms of just the 300000 that you were talking about, we should spend routinely. If you look at uh, building maintenance, you've got building improvement at 20. You've got uh, the equipment the budget, Lisa? Yeah, yeah you, you've got over 300000 that it, It's being spent on this. I'm, I'm happy to see where any of these are sort of in that study. I read it. I didn't see it. So if they're there, I'm happy to be educated. I think 
Trustee Johnson's bringing up a good point when we're talking about like maintenance and and when something becomes obsolete versus improvements. You know, we this is just a personal example. We renovated our kitchen last summer and when we came back into the house, you would not realize how much looked obsolete after the kitchen was remodeled. <laughs> we are now getting bids on redoing the patio outside. Oh, oh so you mean the surrounding areas oh, of, of your our kitchen? Home. Gotcha. And of our okay. home. Gotcha. We want to redo the, the, okay. the bathroom okay. upstairs. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's not obsolete, but it just, it's older. It's when we bought the home. You know, we've been in the home for 10 years. So I can understand a lot of these items are, um, are necessary after um, remodeling and repairing um, the HVAC system, for example, or um, you know, refining our our um, computer network. But I think you know there is a good point here to bring up to maybe maybe expand on some of our. It sounds like there's a lot of good faith um, evidence that these figures have been have been um, you know, they've been come up with in in a very 